want to rock! <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Rockopedia. I am Music Man Mike. That is Dylan, the producer over there. And welcome to the studio, please. Well, not from this studio. His studio in Los Angeles, California. Mr. Paul Fig joins us for a second return visit. How are you, Paul? I'm good. How are you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yep. I had to get a second one because I didn't get to be part of the first one. Um, you and Joe and Dylan did that one together. And uh, I, I re-listened to the show to make sure that we weren't revisiting topics today. And uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that episode. Uh, you kind of lost me about halfway through when you started talking about patching and miking and all this. Oh yeah, the work, the work. The important that you do. stuff. Yeah, the technical work. <laughs> Speaking of technical work, uh, Joe uh, Gypsy Joe from Richmond, Virginia, is not with us today because he had some technical difficulties. Whether it was laptop or phone or maybe something here in the studio, but we couldn't get it figured out in time. So. Uh, we're running a little bit late here, but the people out there in TV land don't know that because this is going to be recorded and put out there. But yeah, in the meantime, Mr. Fig, Fig has been very patient with us, uh, about 25 minutes worth of patience. And I, I can tell he's just fonching at the bit to come over here and fix something. <laughs> What's wrong with Joe's laptop? Where's the cords? Let me check this. Let me run that. I know he's just driving him nuts because that, that's what Paul does in the studio. He can get up and fix anything. Right, Paul? That's yeah. what you do. Yeah. You're a workaround. Repatch, cycle down, whatever. Yep, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so Paul, I uh, was telling every, I was tell, talking to Dylan about uh, and and uh, just now about the show that I re-listened to. So, one of the things I want to talk to you about today was, first of all, well, before we do that, let's talk about what you're doing now because we just had a brief conversation about a, a band you're working with now out of Seattle, there in Los Angeles. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what you're working on and what you did late last night or early this morning or what's, what's your schedule like? Uh, well, so uh, I met this band uh, back in 2018 and they are called uh, 10 Miles Wide. I saw them at a show, a friend of mine dragged me to to go check out another band. And I really loved the way these guys, you know, just took the stage and their music, uh, you know, just, their perspective and so you know i reached out in 2018 and we had a chat and they were like we'd love to work with you just you know they're not on a label they're paying for everything out of their own pockets so but now they're trying to release some new material and some older material so they asked me to remix a track for them and uh, we'll see where we go from there very cool so you're you pretty yeah. much stay busy a lot don't you you're busy uh right now yeah i'm pretty busy yeah Lucky to be busy yeah. too, right? I mean, just the, the whole thing, the, the last year or so of the COVID thing really affected a lot of people, probably including you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we had to shut our studio down for two and a half months. And, wow. you know, our business is keeping that door open. Yep. So, you know, it's, uh, that, was, that was a little tough. But, uh, you know, somehow, some way we, we muscled through that. And, you know, we're doing pretty good. Uh, you know, it's a great little studio. And, you know, there are artists out there that just want to, you know, a quality room that's, you know, private, you know, and it's, you know, it's a, it's a recording studio. Both me and my partner are producer engineers ourselves. So uh, when other producer engineers come in, they're like, wow, everything works. Because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're in there and if it doesn't work, it needs to work. Yeah. You know, that's why it's in the room. But you still have like, rolls uh, of duct tape all over the place, right? Oh yeah, yeah. You got to have you know lots of gaff tape. You got to have lots of uh, extension cords and power strips. You name it, quarter inch cables, <laughs> Wi-Fi passwords. Yeah. Hey, so for those of you that didn't uh, uh, watch or, or listen to on Spotify, the very first show that Paul was on that was back on December twenty second of two thousand twenty, and uh, that was one of the episodes of our Grungepedia. Uh, block that we did. I think we did three or four of the Grungepedia shows, and we had to get Paul on there because. Uh, number one, just he knows a lot about the music on the West Coast. So we're talking about not just California, but the bands out of Portland, bands out of Seattle. And then uh, also at, at the time, and, and for you guys that don't know this either, uh, he has been working exclusively with Alice in Chains. I think it started out, if I remember correctly, your, your, your story was they kind of hired you, you got to meet, you got to know each other. And now here you are working on Jerry Cantrell's solo album. 
Yep. Or worked yeah. on. So uh, I built that relationship starting in 2008. And, uh, you know, they kept coming back. So me and my producer, Nick Raskulenix, would, you know, just rally those guys, get them in the studio and make it happen. So that was uh, Devil Put First, Black Gives Way to Blue, and The Devil Put Dinosaurs Here, and last was uh, Rainy or Fog back in 2018 up in Seattle. Now I have to, uh, I'll have to confess here that I, I lost a touch with Allison Chains there for a while. Uh, now mm -hmm. Rainier Fog drew me back in. Uh, excellent album from the time you put that thing on to the very end. It's it's a great album. It sounds like Allison Chains. Not to say that any of it didn't there for a while, but this really yeah. goes back. This really goes back to Allison Chains. I think for me anyway. And I was a big Allison Chains fan the same way you on the other episode talk about facelift. Yeah, we were all grouped. Oh, yeah. We all got sucked into that thing big time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great album. Yeah, they're, Go ahead. They're they're all, they're all great. And uh, if you you'll notice on the Jerry Cantrell solo record, it sounds like Alice too. But you know, it, it's it's Jerry's voice is what you're hearing. So I, a lot of people didn't realize that Alice in Chains is basically a two lead singer band. Or you know, Jerry took a lot of you know, he was in there a lot with, you know, harmonies or background vocals. So uh, that never went away. So that, that's the cool part about Alice in Chains now. I mean, like their new singer couldn't be more opposite than Lane. He's like a tall, you know, tall guy uh, with a, you know, a bright, you know, a, a bright wide range voice. It's not dark. And uh, he just steps to the plate and does his thing. I think he sounds more like Ian Asbury. And Lane, but when you put him with Jerry, it sounds like Alice in Chains, and they sing so great together. Yeah, yeah I haven't had the chance to see them uh, live uh -huh. with the new singer, uh, but yeah, I definitely his, his voice definitely complements the music. But like you were saying, yeah. Jerry Jerry as a singer. So when I first got facelift all those years ago, I didn't realize that they were doing that. They were both singing. Yeah, I didn't realize that. You have to listen real close because they almost sound alike. Lane and, and Jerry sound a lot alike. And so that's what threw me off when I was listening to it. And then I don't know if it was a live concert video that I saw one time, or maybe I just figured it out by listening to the vocals or something. I was in a band that, that we did some Alice in Chains music, so maybe that's where it came from. But I finally figured out, mm -hmm. I said, man, the guitar player's singing, and, he, and he's great. He sounds good. Yeah, he, he's, he's got a, a really unique voice, is, you know, it's, and it's pretty recognizable. Uh, I think that's an, such an important part for any any artist is to have a voice, and, and you know, and know that hey, I don't sound like everybody else, and not be insecure about it, but you know, embrace it. It's like, yo, I sound different. I'm this is recognizable, and I think that's cool. Yeah, no, that's you're absolutely right. And then and then the other thing too, besides the vocals, so you just got done saying that his solo album does sound a lot like Alice in Chains, or you can hear the Alice in Chains in it. His voice, but also probably his guitar. Am I right on that? Yeah, it's it's those two things. You, it's he can play like two notes, and you're like, that's Jerry Cantrell. <laughs> and the same same with his voice. It's like as soon as you hear him singing, it's like that's that's Jerry Cantrell. So it's a it, you know he, he and that's such a hard thing for any artist to do, but he it's just you know it's in his DNA. It's what he is, yep. and uh, and everybody hears it. And it's recognizable. So then, uh, the other day, I'm looking on the internet or whatever, whatever I was reading, mm -hmm. and they had a picture of him going on tour, and he's got a new band behind him, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, and who are those guys? So, well, I think you probably saw the picture of their, uh, like, the behind the scenes of the video for Brighton. This was a black and white picture. It was a group, group photograph yeah. of black and white. Yeah, so uh, they, they shot this video, Brighton, uh, Danny Trejo's son uh, directed, and uh, you know it's a fun, fun video. But they had this photographer who is, were doing these uh, old timey. I think they're called acid plates. Okay. You know, they're just old school film, old school developing. And she just she she stood those guys back there and uh, snapped the shot. Now I'm not sure if that's going to be the band because right now that's Abel Boreal on drums. Vincent Jones on uh, keyboards and piano, uh, Greg Pucciato 
he's definitely gonna, probably going to be touring with them. And uh, then Tyler Bates, uh, who, who's also a co-producer on the record. But, uh, so I don't know if he'd be playing bass live or if Duff McKagan, who played on the record, would be able to come out on the road with them. But uh, it'll be interesting. I'm sure he's going to put together a great band. And to kind of go off of that, because um, as I was doing a little bit of research about this album, not only is it one of the first few albums that you've like produced for Alice in Chains, because uh, usually you're doing the engineering and things like that. And yeah. I would like to circle back around to what that looked like for you. Um, but to go off of the Duff McKagan uh, comment, so this album actually featured a lot of musicians that weren't necessarily Cantrell. So how did that recording process go, bringing everybody in? Um, I know COVID's impacted a lot of things. I just didn't know if that looked any different as compared to some earlier records you guys have worked on. Yeah, so, you know, we did this uh, a little, uh, you know, a lot different from the Alice in Chains record. You know, that's, that's you know, we got Jerry, Sean, Mike, and Will. Uh, They'll take the songs and we'll vibe that out live on the floor. Then we'll start, we'll start building the track up from there. Uh, this, you know, but they take their time. It's like they're Alice in Chains. They're not in any type of rush. But this, you know, this is Jerry's thing. He's, he's hiring guys to come in. So we did the drums. We tracked drums pretty quick in like four days and, uh, for, the, for the whole record. And uh, and we, you know, we jump from that studio, which was a place called Igloo, to my studio where I set up for guitar. Uh, and then we we worked on all the guitars, and then kind of got set up at Jerry's house for vocals. After that, that was like uh, eleven days for guitars. Uh, so everybody else, Tyler Bates, kind of like wrangled, like you know, hey, let's get Michael Rose on on in here to do some pedal steel on this track, or let's get uh, Jordan over here to do some piano. Uh, so that that was you know cool cool to do that and then then uh, you know Jerry was you know hey you know something's not right with these these drum tracks you know we need to we need to like really hone in on what's going on here and uh, you know so you know we were already talking with uh, Joe Barisi about mixing the record and he was like you know hey well if you're gonna get anybody doing these drums uh, why don't you give Abel Boreal Jr. a call. And he came in, he, 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 you know, because of COVID, he was all remote. So we, you know, had him, you know, he blasted through a couple of tracks. We're like, that's awesome. Great. Done. And so, uh, you know, that's how we did it. We, we kind of had to, like, you know, reach out to these guys. And then towards the end, uh, that's when I reached out to my, my friend Vincent Jones, who's, uh, you know, just... A, r- a ridiculous talent. He's a composer. He's uh, Sarah McLaughlin's music director. He's you know he's played with that just about everybody, and he's a great producer as well. Uh, I brought him in, and he tracked pianos for Brighton and a couple of other tracks, and uh, for this, for the, you know, the cover the Elton John cover, and uh, he did such a beautiful job. So, uh, that, you know, we, 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 you know, we didn't just keep it inside the camp. We spread out and, uh, you know, grab the musicians we thought we could, you know, do, you know, add to the flavor of the record. So the, the, the gentleman you spoke about, Abel, what are, what are his credits? What, what will we know him from? Abel Boreal Jr.? Well, uh, he's uh, Courtney, uh, Paul McCartney's uh, touring drummer right now. That's he's how played, I knew him. You know, him and his dad, him and his dad are both, you know, <laughs> You know, they're, they're like the, you know, like for session players, they're like the guys. So okay, okay. It was so, so great to, you know, so he's I don't the, know if you watched the he's Brighton a big, video, he's a but guy, he's just right? cruising along, at, like effortless, effortless, effortlessly. Yeah. He's he's a big guy, right? Pretty good size yeah. guy? Yeah, okay. And I know exactly who you're talking about. Wow, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're Paul McCartney's drummer, you're doing something right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that gig just doesn't go to anybody. Oh, I mean, his... His, his touring band, everybody in the band, the, the guitar players, I mean, whoever else is in that band besides, I, know, I, I, I can visualize the guitar player, the blonde-headed guy. Uh, mm-hmm. He always reminded me of Duff McKagan. And then the drummer, and then, of course, Paul. I don't know who else is in the band, but, yeah, yeah. Though, he, he uses the same guys every year, and he has for quite a while, mm-hmm. so that's, that's pretty cool. I, I, like it when, I like it when you find a unit that works well together and continue to use them. 
I lost respect for yeah. I lost respect for Billy Joel thirty some years ago when he fired all his guys and started hiring different uh, people. Yeah. I mean that is not to me that's not how you do it. I, I saw a double mm. bill with, with Billy Joel and Elton John. And guess what? Who was on stage with Elton John? The same guys that have been with him for forty five years. Yeah. You know, it just yeah. ma- it just makes for, for it better. The camaraderie, the whole darn thing. For me anyway. Now, a lot of people go in there, they don't care who's on guitar, bass and drums, but I pay attention to that stuff. That 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 hits yeah. me. Well, you know, and you know, that's I just dealt with this with uh, Linda Carlisle. I help out uh, on production for her live shows, uh, you know, for the past few years. And she's got such an amazing crew. And uh, she has this guitar player, James Nisbet, who's just a monster guitar player. And he's the music director. Well, because of COVID, the manager, who's also in the UK, as well as uh, James, uh, they can't get here. So we just did a couple of shows, and uh, we had to work in another guitar player. And, you know, just, you know, Belinda Carlisle's songs sound simple, but they're, it's like so many chord changes in there. It's, you know, the songwriting is so complicated. It's wild. So, uh, you know, I, another friend of mine, uh, this guy Jimmy Messer, came in, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, we rehearsed, you know, I think four or five days. And, you know, he had to, you know, he had to step into those shoes and, like, make it, seem like he'd been playing this stuff for 10 years. So, uh, you know, serious respect to any of those touring musicians. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it would be easy, easier to, you know, always, it's just know your band is solid and they you know that all the material like the back of their hand and you know, why mess with a good thing <laughs> just cause you're trying to save a little bit of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There was a documentary on that Billy Joel thing too. And all those guys are just they really got their feelings hurt. I mean, they just didn't know why he was doing what he was doing, but he got, he got pushed to do that by the record company, I think. And all, all yeah. the people all the people in the office, you know, were, were telling him what to do. And, and he listened to yeah. them, which, he, which was a big, big mistake, in, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. But, hey, so if you're watching the show with us today, let me remind you a couple things. Uh, Paul not only has done work with Alice in Chains, but Paul, name some of the other bands that you've worked with over the years. Shoot. Uh, Ghost, Deftones, Shadows Fall, uh, Evanescence, um, God, there's, uh, I keep forgetting. Uh, I worked with uh, Neil Peart and Rush. Uh, that was awesome. Slipknot, that was a, a really good one. Pretty impressive list, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And then also, uh, the, the reason that we have access to Mr. Fig is because of my brother Joe, uh, Gypsy Joe, straight out of Richmond, Virginia. He used to live in Phoenix. We call him Gypsy <laughs> Joe because he's not only from Phoenix, Seattle. Milwaukee, New Orleans, Wichita, and now Richmond, Virginia. That's that's how it got wow. his name. <laughs> but you guys lived in Phoenix in the eighties, right? Or the nineties? What yeah, 90, 91, yeah. I believe. It was about the time yeah. that the grunge kicked off and you guys got to see a lot of bands that were just starting out, you know, in little tiny uh, places and nobody well, it was knew what so these cool. Guys. I mean, music back then was, you know, all these new bands were just popping out of everywhere, it seemed like. And Joe had Hey, have you heard of this guy? Have you heard of Tad? Have you heard of Grun Truck? And it was just like, you know, our brains were exploding back then where we just couldn't get enough. So yeah, yeah it was super fun. Then I then I got a job at Zia Records. <laughs> yeah, and, and Zia was a, a, a local store in uh, Phoenix, and they probably had, I don't know, back in their heyday, they may have had eight locations around town, something like that, six or eight. Yeah, I think like five or six. Yeah, and there was one in my neighborhood. It was in, within walking distance. And it was, a, it was a, a record store about the size of two of these rooms, and they crammed as much stuff in there as they could. So there was T-shirts and posters on the wall, bumper stickers, yeah. there was records, there was you name it, anything you could think of. A music lover like me at 21 years old would just go in there and just have a heyday and spend way too much money. But uh, Z, oh, was, yeah. Z was cool. I don't well, even know if they're still around or not. They, I hope they're still around. They're, I mean, they were... It was such a cool uh, concept back then because back in the 90s, uh, you know, hey, you can buy used CDs or sell your used CDs that you, you, know, you want to trade up for new music. So uh, it was, a, you know, just a cool scene. Yep. Uh, and, and learning about all sorts of music, you know, it's like uh, as an employee there, you have to learn, hey, you're in charge of A through H. So make sure your section's alphabetized and organized and, you know, whatever we need to reorder, we can reorder. 
And then, you know, obviously that gets shuffled around and, you know, you end up learning the whole store, even, you know, in the jazz and heritage section. So uh, you're just constantly exposed to all sorts of music yeah. for your work. So that's, I thought that was super cool. And Joe liked it because it was his main outlet for the New York Dolls t-shirt that he needed to replace every six months. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk in there, pull one off the wall, and I said, oh, put it on your tab, Joe. New yeah. York Dolls. <laughs> Am I right about that, Paul, or what? Yeah. I still got, I still, got yeah. people, still got people to this day that say when they see pictures of Joe, they haven't seen him for a long time. They say, where's his New York Dolls shirt at? <laughs> and and uh, I forgot, about, forgot about Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, yeah Milwaukee. Yeah, there was a yeah. that was his story on that was it it snows six months out of the year and it never melts and then in the summertime all the beer companies the breweries throw these massive concerts you know every weekend so yeah. it was a cool place to be in the spring and summer but the rest of the time it's just miserable mm. yeah hey uh yeah I, I i'm born and raised in los angeles so i just don't know any better oh yeah it's, well, it, I, i'll visit but yeah. that's about it yeah that's about yeah. it um uh, i was gonna say too my my claim to fame from Zia Records one day, I walked over there like I always did on a Saturday, just look around, see what they got. And uh, on my way out, they had a little rack by the, by the door that had like new releases or just off, out of, off the wall stuff, I, I should say. And I walked out of there one day and I looked down and I thought, what is this? Live like a suicide. And I picked it up and it was Duff and, Duff and uh, Axel on the front with the big hair. And yeah. It was, and it was their album that they re released on their own label, Uzi Suicide. So they shipped it from oh, Los wow. Angeles. Yeah, they shipped it from Los Angeles. It was sitting there. There's probably 10 copies. I don't know how many was there. But I looked at it, and I'd heard of them. And I flipped around, looked at the back, and I saw their picture. I thought, well, it's worth a try. And they got a version of Aerosmith's Mama Ken on here. So it was like, oh, wow. it was like five songs. So like side one had the five or six songs on it, and side two was just blank. It wasn't even cut. It was just a flat, <laughs> yeah, flat vinyl. I hadn't even heard of that. I, That's insane. Never had, I'll, well, if you look it up on eBay, a, a yeah. real uh, they try to they try to pass off the fakes, but a real Uzi Suicide yeah. uh, labeled uh, Guns N' Roses Live Like a Suicide will go for probably four or five hundred dollars on eBay. Wow! Yeah, so Insane. I I purchased mine probably back then for five bucks. I had it for years and years and years, and then one day I was thinning out my record collection. This was back when the records were kind of dying out and CDs were. Yeah on the rise and mm -hmm. I knew I knew that somebody would give me good money for that thing and I took it just to see what this guy here in Texas actually uh, would buy it for and uh, he told me and I was I said you got to be kidding me man this thing's worth some money he said I, I know it is but I got to resell it and this and that well he he, he, yeah. paid, he paid me for it nothing close to four hundred dollars but now yeah. when I get on eBay and look at look it up I just get sick to my stomach I can't believe I let that thing go oh well so now somebody else can enjoy it yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what they're enjoying. They're enjoying something that got played about 150 times, too. So yeah. It's got a little crackle and pop. There's still some too. music coming, yeah, got a squeaking little, out of that yeah. thing. Yeah. Hey, so <laughs> another thing you guys talked about on the last show and I wanted to be a part of, and I just want to bring it up today before we close. We've got about five, ten more minutes. Uh, you spent some time in the world famous uh, Sound, Sound City in Los Angeles or the Los Angeles area? Van Nuys. Van Nuys, yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. I, I told you earlier, I love that documentary. I love the Dave, Dave Grohl documentary about Sound City. And I tell people all the time, when I've let people borrow it, friends of mine and, and, and people that I work with that I know are interested in music as well, and I say, and I say well, what is it? What's it about? And I say, you know what it's really about? It's about the soundboard. It's a movie about a soundboard. And, it, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a movie about that desk, and it's a movie about that space. Uh, it, it was such a wild fluke. So, you know, I... I ended up there, you, you know, uh, I was in this band, Amen, and we tracked our record up at Indigo Ranch. And it's, they have such a, it's, they're like a, a sound city on, on their own. And that's a totally other story. But uh, they had this amazing desk, hand-wired, you know, transformers from, you know, Ted Jensen, this like custom API desk. And our singer, Casey, was, wasn't digging the guitar sounds coming off the mic breeze. So... Uh, we ended up in another Neve room called Grandmaster, and it was better. And so when we uh, were working on, a, I think it was B-sides for just right before a tour, we ended up at Sound City. 
And that's where we were introduced to this desk in this room, this drum room. And so, uh, you know, we did, we, we ended up tracking the whole record. Uh, we've come for your parents with Mike Frazier and Ross Robinson. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it was like, it was all about those mic pre's and how aggressive they sounded. And, you know, uh, the drums in that drum room uh, with that desk, uh, it was pretty unstoppable. But uh, that, that place, I mean, it's such a fluke. It was the Vox manufacturing. Like, it, you know, it was just, they built amps there. And somehow, some way, there was a control room built. And somebody, you know, Tom Skeeter put a board in there. And, you know, when everybody, you know, a little weird history, the, uh, they had that Neve desk in there from like 73. And towards the 80s, everybody in town was moving to SSL consoles and they just couldn't afford it. So they just kept cleaning that thing and buffing it out and making sure, you know, it was working. And, uh, you know, Butch Vig comes in, tracks never mind, and boom, they're back on the map. And, you know, you, you bands just couldn't get in there fast enough. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. That's a, that, that part of the movie where everything turns around, that, that, just, that just made the whole thing. I mean, that just tells you. And that kind of got, I think that's kind of the beginning of getting everybody back to a more of a real sound, you know, the, more of mm -hmm. a, what you heard from records. And now look, now look what's going on. Now we actually got records, which takes me back to another thing you guys talked about last time. And I didn't realize this until I listened to the show last night. But you were talking about the, lot, the streaming services and, and what it did financially to, to you, to the studios, mm. to, the, to the record companies, to the, the people that print the pictures on the labels, all that stuff. And I got to think about it. Yeah. You know what? I never thought of that before, but you're absolutely right. So now you got all these record plants shut down because nobody needs a record anymore, and they're just sitting there. Well, now they're being revived. Yeah. Now, now like they have, I, are there like two record store days a year now? Because it seems like, oh, well, we got to get this record press before records, you know, record store day because, that, you know, you got to do that months in advance. Uh, Otherwise, you, you won't get your record printed in time for your release. But, uh, it, yeah, it's wild. And I love that, you know, vinyl's coming back. And it's such a, such a nice thing. And in, I don't know if you guys realize, but it's an actual physical thing your ears are hearing. Your ears aren't trying to make up the difference in, you know, uh, uh, with digital, which is just ones and zeros being converted. Uh, just think of how your eye looks at a photograph and your brain is making up difference in the pixels even though it's so tight it looks smooth it's not you zoom in it's not smooth and it's the same thing with music so when you're listening to music your ears finishing the the sine wave curve of all the frequencies uh when you're playing vinyl you're hearing everything you're hearing the physical you know the needle scrape through the groove and produce sound in real time it's a physical thing happening. Your ears are taking in all of it. Yeah, and it's something that we uh, something that we lost when the when the CD came out, and and we didn't and we didn't know it. N nobody knew mm -hmm. it. They, they kind of pulled the wool over our eyes. That oh, it's still the same thing. It's just a different way of listening to it. Yeah, and it's um, on on top of vinyl coming back and really the physical way of listening to music coming back it also seems like a lot of recording styles that were lost um, are starting to make a resurgence at least with some smaller bands uh, that are kind of proliferating throughout the scene uh, people are using tape machines again to do a lot of recording and um, analog tape as well uh, more and more people locking themselves in their garden sheds and recording raw instead of using their computers to go through oh. things or so on and so forth, and not being able to do overdubs, which I think is very interesting. Um, artists willingly saying, well, we're not going to do overdubs on this. We're just going to track it. Whenever we get, we get. And um, it's it's been interesting. There's a lot more hiss and uh, surface noise coming out of yeah. new music now, which I think is very interesting and definitely an exploration of what we were doing before. And I, I think it's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, a friend of mine was like, hey, can you listen to this? There's something wrong with this mix. And I'm like, all right, well, it sounds like a rock band. And, you know, did you hear that hiss? And I'm like, well, maybe that's 
they recorded on tape, right? Yeah, well, they probably, uh, you know, they're compressing everything and the things are getting, the quiet things are getting louder. And of course, you're going to hear that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, tape, tape is nice. It's a luxury. And, you know, so bands that can, you know, record the tape, it's like, wow, okay, so you got that much extra money to <laughs> spend on six reels of tape and, and then time of, you know, rewinding. And, you know, you might get like you know, three songs in the day or, you know, it's just, it's such a workout. But, uh, I mean, these converters work great nowadays. Uh, but yeah, it's, you can drive that ship as tough as you want. No overdubs, you know, so you you can do that but i think that's a, such a luxury thing uh uh it, it but, definitely you know, it does is. sound great it's you know but then you do have hiss yeah it, and and you're right about that it is a downgrade um it's definitely something like once you've already made your money you're like oh, okay you guys want to record this next one on tape and just like call well, it like, indie wait <laughs> somebody made money <laughs> uh you know i when I, uh, Sound City went through a couple of different iterations lately, and uh, they had you could track live to a lathe master. <laughs> so that that's like the you know if you don't want to do any overdubs and you just <laughs> go straight like you mix straight to that two track lathe master, and they're cutting it like as you're playing. So it's you have to be flawless yeah that's when that's you're crazy. done that's it i mean i guess if you're a live band then it works you know like if you're really into that kind of thing and you just won't yeah. get super raw but that almost seems like more of a headache for people like you who have to like actually go in and be like all right guys we gotta we gotta line this up a little bit we have to at least maybe not perfect it but yeah not have so many blemishes right. over the yeah, top I've, I've not worked on any of those sessions but that the guy that was cutting the, the the master would have to get flown out like every time so it's not like the the assistant engineer is cutting that thing <laughs> they're hiring a guy that yeah. specifically makes sure this thing goes down correctly definitely so is tape expensive gosh yeah i think it's i think it's like 265 a roll now or 300 a roll wow let's yeah. take a look didn't realize See, that the, the one uh, I've been in the studio a couple times back w when I was in a band and and we did on we did it on tape one time and we did did it on uh, um, D uh, DAT one time a smaller studio we did this yeah like a, like or a, a dat yeah 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 we did that. Yeah. that that was the the last one I ever did but the first time was in a full fledged mm -hmm. studio in a little tiny town in Newton Kansas this guy owned a music store in Wichita. And he had a recording yeah. studio at his house, and you go in the basement, and all the he had everything, and all the rooms, all the, the nice, nice engineering room, a, 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 a good board. I don't know what the brand was. I didn't care back then. I was just glad to be in a studio. Yeah. But yeah, we definitely had did did it on tape. And my guitar player, Michael Lacey, still has those tapes to this day. But just collecting dust. Yeah. Somewhere. So uh, you know, the, the tape will live on that. The music on the tape will live on there for 20 years. Then you have to bake it and transfer it to another reel or digitize it. Then you, then you're, you know, depending on what you digitize it and put it on, another a spinning hard drive that, you know, from what I understand, the uh, lubrication that helps keep that drive spinning in the middle, that evaporates after five years. So, wow. you know, uh, somebody's going to have to keep archiving and archiving and archiving, you know. So I believe our. Or put it back on. Or put it back on tape for 20 years. I believe our tape has <laughs> expired in that case. Yeah. <laughs> de 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 put definitely it the, expired. Put it on the cloud. Hey, Paul, thanks for joining us, man. I got one more question for you. We always try to do a little, sure. Van, a little Van Halen corner before we go. Uh, did you have any interaction with any of those guys in the, in the band or, the, or the, the studio, the 5150 studio or anything like that? Old, current, new? I have not. But, you know, if it wasn't for Eddie Van Halen, I would have never picked up a guitar. Uh, my parents, you know, they ran a jazz club when I was growing up. And when I finally heard Van Halen's first record, an Eruption, I was blown away. Like, my brain literally was melting. And I'm like, yeah. I have to do that. And so, you know, me and my friends, you know, we started a band. And I was 13, 14. And 
you know, all I wanted to do is play guitar and learn about music as much about music as I could. And, to, you know, I just wanted to shred and that's, you know, that's all I wanted to do. But I did get to meet Eddie at uh, Sound City. So there's two stories. Uh, he came in to work on, uh, put solos down on this, uh, this pop stars record. And, uh, you know, he was just, I mean, like, I was blown away. It was like, I'm like, oh, that's from Mean Street. That's from this. And, like, I can hear the little, like, pieces of, you know, solo he's throwing around. And uh, so that was super cool. And then the second time was Jerry Cantrell dragged me down to go see Van Halen uh, doing their reunion shows with uh, David Lee Roth down at the Forum. And we got to go, you know, dance, you know, backstage in the hallways. And uh, there's Eddie standing in the hallway next to a road case, just, you know, warming up his fingers and like, oh, hey, this is my engineer, Paul Fig. And, you know, he didn't remember me, but I was like, hey, how are you doing? And he was so nice and pleasant. It was just, you know, that was such a cool thing. Yeah. I was, I I'm was lucky. Fortunate. <laughs> I, was, I was fortunate enough to meet Eddie several times, or and if I wasn't talking to him or meeting him, I was in his presence, and he really was just yeah. just a regular guy. He did he, he the, the superstar part he enjoyed for two hours on stage, and after that he really didn't want nothing to do with it. So when you see him doing yeah. interviews and stuff, he's doing the best he can to to make the guy running the camera doing the interview happy. But he he'd rather be doing something else. He, he really he wasn't yeah, sure. he wasn't that guy. But yeah, you're right. He always super nice. I I, I mean. And the friend that I knew, or I still know to this day, that was that was best friends with him. At one time, they actually lived together. He he lived with Eddie for a while. Uh, just was he was down on his luck, and uh, <clears throat> he stayed there. He he's told me a million stories, and you, and it, that that's just that's just absolutely right. He was uh, just a real down to earth guy, uh, very humble. Uh, knew how lucky he was to be doing what he's doing and getting paid for it. Also very creative, yeah. very creative going into the, his workshop. And he had thousands of parts and pieces everywhere, and he would just noodle stuff together or, or try something new and do something different. But yeah, that was always really cool. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I, I was very very lucky to to have met him. Um, but yeah, I always like to do the do the Van Halen corner and see uh, see if anybody has a story because usually somebody has has a story or something. And then and there's another story for Jerry Cantrell since you know uh, his record's coming out at the end of the month on the 29th and. October, so that's Brighton. Uh, Eddie gave him one of his Wolfgangs, like Gold Top. And during his last record, uh, at, uh, for I think it was Degradation Trip, uh, that guitar just didn't make it back into his storage. And somebody, you know, had taken it from the studio. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, last year while we're, tr while we're tracking, he's like, hey man, some some guy's got a line on my, on my guitar. They think it's, you know, they think they found it. And, uh, I guess, you know, a couple of days later, the guy sent pictures of the wood grain in the neck and it's, you know, you can't, yeah. you know, and, and he instantly recognized it and he compared with other photos and he's like, dude, that's my guitar. And, uh, so it was a wild story, but this guy ended up paying, you know, a bunch of money for the guitar, not Jerry. But uh, this guy who 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 suspected that this guitar was Jerry's, and then let him know and gave it back to Jerry. And so Jerry, uh, I forget what he did. I think he gave him one of his, uh, you know, his new reissue uh, rampages, and uh, you know. But that was such a wild story that he got that guitar back. That is a great story. And so, yeah. uh, and and so, another thing you just said a minute ago was, you know, if it wasn't for hearing Eddie Van Halen interruption, you probably would have never picked up the guitar. So. You know how many people have said that exact same sentence? I mean, I've, yeah. heard, I've heard that for 30, 40 years now. It's, but I mean, like, literally, like, my yeah. life wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't be where I am right no. now if it, was, no, I know. <laughs> if it wasn't for yeah. any, like, sparking, putting that spark of music in my brain. And I wasn't a, I, I'm not a guitar player. I never was a guitar player. Yeah. I, I played around with it a little bit, but, you know, I was thinking to myself, and I know people get tired of me talking about it, and I try not to push it too hard. But I'm telling you, Paul, I, I mean, I'm 57 now. I was in the I was in the heyday of Van Halen, and if they played if, yeah, they, you if, were. They, if they played Wichita every Friday night, I would have found a way to get thirteen dollars to go see them every Friday night, which was a lot of money <laughs> at the time. But it was so fun, the best rock show you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it just was, and it was consistent time in and time out. I've seen them in different cities. I've seen them with both singers, and it's just it just it it, it, it was just one of the best rock and roll shows you. Mean three seen. singers. Huh? 
I didn't see. I didn't see the third. Don't forget guy. about Sharon. I didn't see. I didn't see Gary. No, I did not see that. But yeah, I, I, I barely even remember him when we talk about it. I, I need somebody like you to remind me because I forget. Hey man, we're past our time. We're gonna let you go, Paul. Once again, appreciate you. Appreciate you for uh, hanging in there at the beginning and our uh, uh, technical difficulties, sir. Take care, and, and we'll do hey, it yeah. again sometime. And we'll we'll get awesome. Joe. Well, thank you guys we'll for get, having me. We'll get Joe say on thank here next you. time. Thank, thanks for <laughs> Joe coming in on this. That's right. All right, Paul. Have a good day, sir. Thank you, everyone, for watching Rockopedia. Right. I'm Music Man Mike. Paul Figs out, and that is Dylan, the producer. We'll get Joe and Joe uh, Romeo Joe back in here next time. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. All right, take care, you guys.